Take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. I'm going to preach a message this morning. I, I try to preach, I probably preach a message every year on looking for the Lord to come back. And usually I'll preach it in January or so, or sometimes I think I preach it in the spring. But it, it's one of them subjects that I try to keep fresh in your minds that we should continually to watch for the Lord, different mentalities and attitudes of the Lord coming back. Now I'd like to preach this morning on the differences from a guess on the Lord coming back and the things that we know that we should be doing looking for the Lord to come back. There's a, there's a difference. You say, do you ever take guesses on when the Lord will come back? Yeah, I took one years ago. And I hope. Then I thought I was wrong. I'm sure hoping I was right because that would be this year. And I'll tell you, it is an absolute guess. It's not a doctrine. It's not something I'm teaching. Matter of fact, what I will teach of what I believe is the imminent return of Christ. In other words, He can come back at any time. That is what I believe. And that's what I teach. Alright, uh, take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Why do we believe in the imminent return of Christ? Why do we believe that Christ could come back at any time? or that we really don't know when He's coming back, it's kind of one of them deals where we should be looking for Him all the time. It's within His time. Now the best uh, scripture I can give you for that belief is here in Acts chapter 1. And pick up verse 6. Acts chapter 1 verse 6. It says, When they therefore were come together, they asked of Him, saying, Lord, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now when he does that, that's going to be the restoration of Israel. That's the millennial kingdom that is promised where he will sit down on the throne of David and reign as a physical king from Jerusalem. Now there's plenty of prophecies through the Old Testament. They are looking for this to happen. They're looking for him to reign as a king. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Now what's that talking about? That's talking about him setting up the rain, the second advent. Well, we know that the rapture is going to be roughly seven years prior to that. We allow the time for the tribulation. Okay? So if you can date the second advent, you can somewhat date the uh, rapture. That's the ideal behind it. There's actually very little said about the rapture. So if you're going to try to date the rapture on just what's said about the rapture, I mean, that's a lost cause. You're not going to... Now, when it comes to the second advent, if you're going to try to date it just by going seven years prior from the second advent, you got a ton told you about the second advent. So what people do when they try to date the rapture is they're going off the second advent. And they'll go your three and a half, seven years, or whatever from the second advent. That's the Lord coming back the second time to reign. And that's what they're que questioning on. But what he says to them... He says, uh, he says, it's not for ye to know. It's only in the Father's hand when he's going to set up that king. They're looking at it for then. I think there's a possibility for them to receive it then. They could have received it at the time of Stephen. Maybe the Lord would have come back then and set up his kingdom if they had received Stephen's message. There's opportunities given to them, and Israel isn't completely set aside, I don't think, till the end of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 28, where he says, I'm going to the Gentiles, I'm done. I think that was their final straw where they're completely set aside. And if you get into too much of that, you come into another dangerous teaching, which is hyper-dispensationalism, and you've got to be careful with that stuff too. But uh, one of the things we can look at here is we can see that 
We don't know exactly when the Lord comes back. We do know what he tells us to do until he comes back. Now that, we can grab a hold of and say, I know that to be true. I took a guess years ago when I was, before I even went to Bible school, I took and was studying some different things Dr. Ruckman taught about when the rapture was going to come and he was wrong and missed the boat. <laughs> Got it wrong. <laughs> and it was, uh, had to do with minusing seven years from the year 2000, going that the year 2000 would be 200 years after the birth of Christ. And then you minus seven, and then you minus four, which had to do with he figured they messed up the calendar by four years, is what they, they think that Jesus Christ was actually born 4 B.C., according to our calendar. That would put 2,000 years after his birth and the seven years for the tribulation being 1989. Okay? So I did a simple equation. Well, if he was right on that, except for he should have went off the death, the cross, instead of the birth. That would put you 2,033 as the death, minus 7 years, minus 4, 2,022. That's the way I came up with it. Man, that would be great if I was right on that one. I just saw on the internet somebody taught that. I have no idea who the guy was. He came up with all these other different reasons why 2022 had to be the year. Some of them were pretty lame. <laughs> I thought, I mean, he's stretching. He wanted it real bad. He was stretching some of that stuff. But, uh, I mean, I watch that. It's entertaining to me, but I don't take it too serious. Matter of fact, if the Lord doesn't come back in 2000, the spring of 2022, you know it's not going to waver my faith any in the belief that the Lord's going to... I'm not going to sit there and say, where's the promise of His coming? Because I don't really think that... I, I look at this stuff, it's simple math, and you can make math do just about anything you want when you get to decide the starting and ending part of your math. Amen? Which is basically what they're doing. Anyone that guesses, that's what they're doing. They determine the starting and the end, and then they just pick a number to make their point. That's the same thing I'm doing. Okay? That's what I'm doing. Alright? It's a guess. It's nothing but a guess. You can't really guess it. You don't really know. At least I don't think you know. And uh, I, I don't think you can figure that thing out. There's a guy that took a guess a few years back. He has a big radio station. That's all. It's called Family Something Radio. What's that guy's name? He was saying the Lord's coming back. It was about three, four years ago. He said, Lord's coming back. Lord's coming back this year. Lord's coming back this year. I think his name's Camping. Is it Camping? Harold Camping. Camping. That guy makes this guess on when the Lord's going to come back. The rapture's going to happen. And it didn't happen that year. And then he starts teaching. Well, the Lord came back spiritually. That's the same thing that JWs did years ago. I mean, no, I mean, if I, I went up, you know, when the Lord came back, He came back in 1986 because He came and lived in my heart, so He must have came back. That's when I got saved. That's when the Lord came back. You know, I mean, that has just as much emphasis of what He tried doing when it was proved He was wrong. Am I? I mean, you've got to understand guesses are guesses. You cannot build a doctrine on a guess. You cannot take and sit there and. Get crazy. You know, when Dr. Upman taught that, Brother Bemis went out and bought a brand new truck because he didn't think he was going to have to pay for it. 
He paid every dime of that truck. <laughs> Dr. Upman was wrong. <laughs> I, mean, I, was, uh, <laughs> I mean, I I laugh every time he says that. I'm not going to go buy a new house just because I think the Lord's coming back this spring. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not going that direction. I'm not going to make his mistake. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Buy me a million dollar house because I won't have to pay for it. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm not going there. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I mean the temptation, you see all the stuff going on around you. You see the way the world's going. You see the wars building up. You see them trying to build chips taking link passports with these chips that they put in your hand. Uh, they're trying to link your credit card, your money with this. And you know your Bible, and you've seen that stuff, and you're like, man, everything in Revelation is unveiling itself right before our eyes. It makes you a little bit crazy. You want to go out and say, hey, man, time's short. I don't have to be so careful anymore with finances because I ain't going to be around much longer. Am I the only one that thinks that way? And I have to step back and say, hey, the Lord says, tells us to walk wisely. Right. He didn't tell me to go act foolish. Walk by faith, yes, but not foolishly. I'm looking for him to come back, but I, I still have to conduct myself for the long run. Amen? I got, I got to look to, hey, if the Lord tarries and I live, God forbid, to be 80. I don't think I'll make it to 80, but <laughs> if I did, if I did, I have to be that long endurance runner that fulfills my life serving Christ to the end. Not just be a flame that flares up and sizzles out. Those that say, where is the promise of His coming? They're flames that flared up and sizzled out because things didn't happen the way they wanted to happen. Amen? I don't want to be that. So you have to step back when you look at the Lord's coming. Say, I'm looking for the Lord to come back, but there were some things He told me about my conduct till He comes that I need to apply to my life. And that's really what I want to look at this morning. I don't want to say go buy you a million dollar house this, because the Lord's coming back this spring. That's not what I'm doing. I'm saying there's things that the Lord told you to do and whether He comes back this spring, comes back next spring, comes back this fall, or comes back tomorrow, these are things you need to be doing. Now, first of all, let's look here in uh, Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 and continue reading. Look at verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be, what? Witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and unto the other most part of the earth. The Lord says, hey, I'm not setting up my kingdom. That's for the Father to decide. But till then, you're going to be witnesses for me. You are to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received them out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, in other words, they're looking up to heaven, their eyes are fixed on heaven, and their jaws are dropped. They're steadfast. I mean, if I watched them ascend up into heaven, my jaw would be dropped. I mean, amen. I'm kind of reading between the line there, but they're looking steadfastly toward heaven. As he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. We know these are angels. Which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? If it was modern day, guess, well, look at my. YouTube video. <laughs> this is why we're looking up into heaven. We just saw the Lord descend up to heaven. And the angel's like, why are you standing there looking up into heaven? What are you doing? We're, we're, we're looking at, up into heaven. You know, uh, we're supposed to be looking for the Lord to come back, but that doesn't mean we're supposed to be standing around doing this all day. You know? Amen? 
We're looking for them, we're watching, but that don't mean we're supposed to stand there gazing up into heaven. They said, uh, uh, look steadfastly toward heaven. Why stand ye looking up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. So they needed to get about what they were told to do. They couldn't stand there and wait for the Lord to come back. They need to go out and get about what the Lord was telling them to do. What did He tell them to do? He says, you need to be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, Jude, Samaria, Judea, and the other most parts of the earth. You know what we need to be doing as we wait for the Lord to come back? We know He's coming back. We look, we're looking for Him to come back. But we need to be doing the things that He's commanded us to do. We need to be witnesses of Him. We need to be witnessing right up till the day He comes back. We need to be fulfilling that commission that He gave us to do while we waited for Him. We're waiting for the Lord to come back. Amen? But we're not waiting idly, just looking up into heaven. If we were, He'd send to it, why, why are you doing this? Why are you just standing there looking up into heaven? That's, that's, that's not what you're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be fulfilling the Great Commission. We're supposed to be going about doing the Lord's business. As we do that, we're supposed to watch and be sober. Take your Bible and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, you have one of the greatest passages on the pre-trib rapture of the Christian. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, you have a, a look at, get a little bit what happens, what Paul was talking about in the previous chapter. Look in verse 16, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's the resurrection of the church. Then we which are alive, now here's the rapture of the church, and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. You know how you can tell the difference between the second advent and the rapture? In the rapture, you meet the Lord in the air and go back. In the second advent, He comes back with you, follow Him, and lands on this earth and sets up a kingdom. I mean, you got to know if you're coming or going. Amen? Amen? Some people, they don't know if they're coming or going. At the rapture, we're going. At the second advent, we're coming. Amen? Amen? So we come back with Him. He's coming to reign. Uh, so this is the rapture of the church. This is when we will ascend up into the air, meet the Lord in the air. He'll lead us out and we'll follow Him. And he'll take us up to the third heaven. All right, that's a rapture of the church. That is what we as Christians are looking for. We're looking for him to come back and call us home into heaven. Now, a guy in the tribulation is looking for him to come back and save them from their troubles. But we're not going to be in the tribulation. We're called out of here before the tribulation. A lot of people get the doctrines of the second coming of Christ in the tribulation mixed up with the second coming of Christ at the rapture. And they can't tell the difference between the two of them. That's the difference between somebody that believes in a pre-trib rapture and somebody that believes in a post-trib rapture, a post-trib coming of Christ. Now, what, how, what are we supposed to be doing? It says, wherefore, comfort one another with these words, verse 18. That's a great comfort. The Lord's coming back. He's going to call us home. Not everybody's going to die. COVID's not going to get us all. I mean, amen. I mean, that's... The Lord's coming back. And we look forward to that. Now look at verse 5. Chapter 5. 
But the times and the seasons, brethren, we have no need that I write unto you. Amen. There's no need they write on about the times and seasons. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Now it's talking about the tribulation time. There. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that, they, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are of the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be what? Sober. Let us watch and be sober. Hey, uh, the Lord coming back shouldn't catch us unawares. We're looking for him. We're ready for him to come back. But we have a job to do. We need to watch and be sober. In other words, we don't need to be distracted. Now, the watch in the Bible is not... A, now, I could go through all the verses of the watchmen, the watch, the fourth watch, the watch of the night. But a lot of times we say, we should be watching till the Lord comes back. We should be a watchman. And people sit there and think it, we ought to sit there with a telescope looking up into outer space looking for the Lord to come back. That's not what it's saying. It's saying we should be sober like a watchman of the night being fully alert of everything around us and giving a warning to those out there. That's what the watchman does. He gives a warning. And we as Christians, as time goes by, we see the signs of the time drawing closer and closer, and we know that our time is limited. Brother, you all know your time's limited. We see, I mean, from 1948 when Israel was regathered as a nation. Big awakening. Come on, wake up. God brought them in as a nation again. They weren't a nation for 2,000 years. And now all of a sudden the Jews is a nation again. In Jerusalem. In the promised land. Things are being set up for end time prophecies. With the physical Jew. We seen that alone should wake us up. But now we're seeing the world falling in and saying, Oh yeah, we need to obey. You have to get vaccine, and then you have to have a chip for a vaccine passport. And with that technology, they also want to make a one world currency and all this stuff. And we're seeing all that stuff unfold before our eyes. It's almost unbelievable to watch it. And, and I, I mean, I used to read the stuff in Revelation. I'm like, I wonder how that's going to transpire. Now I read Revelation. I'm like, I know exactly how that's going to transpire. You know, there's no mystery to it. I mean, every eye is going to see them. Yeah, it's going to be on YouTube. All they have to do is flip on their smartphone. Even the kids have smartphones. Every eye is going to see it. The smartphone does facial recognition. You scan the chip with the smartphone. Everybody's controlled with a smartphone. I mean, that, that's society today. It's getting where, you know, I went without a computer all the way up to about 2007. I never owned a computer until 2007. I had, I found myself looking for a job or trying to get a better job. And I found you cannot look for a job without a computer. Nobody even wants to allow you to walk in and hand a resume to them. They want you to send it on the computer. I found you cannot function in this world without a computer. Not as a young man trying to work, provide for his family. You cannot function without a computer. Yet I, I had to get the computer, and I was behind the times. I 
I didn't know how to work a computer. I had to start learning. So I had a young wife, and I said, here, figure out how to work this. <laughs> you get all the business, and she did it. Well, Rebecca passed and told me I had to start learning. I had to start learning this stuff. And I got the Apple phone, the iPhone, the stuff, and still don't know what I'm doing with it. But I've learned a lot with it. But what I'm seeing, the farther I get into it, is how much society is controlled by it. Right. How much society cannot function without it. And we talk about the old days. Where she was telling me how they used to make bricks to build the houses. Her dad was a carpenter, and they actually made their own bricks and stuff. And I was like, I have no idea how to make my own brick. Now they, she came up a little bit different than what I did, where because they were coming out of the communism and stuff, they, they were a little bit more self-reliant, had to learn how to preserve themselves with nothing. Where we are reliant on the grocery store. We don't know how to make the spaghetti noodle. We don't know how to make the loaf of bread. We don't know how to make that tortilla shell. We don't know where this milk came from. <laughs> I mean, that's a, we think it just showed up in a bottle there. That's this generation. That's my generation. They don't know this stuff. They're too busy teaching them evolution and socialism in school. They didn't teach them that milk came from a cow. <laughs> I mean, you know. That's, I mean, you laugh at that. You think, oh, well, that ain't true, but... I mean, you deal with some of these folks. It seems to be true. But, uh, but society, we see the end times. We see that all everything is set up where society cannot function unless they are tied to the powers that be. Now, all the powers that be, all that stuff, that thing has a great deception over it that there is a controlling factor and those that resist the controlling factor in the tribulation will be killed we'll be out of here we'll be out of here i'm not worried about taking the covid shots taking the mark of the beast or taking the real id as the mark of the beast or the credit card as the mark of the beast i'm not worried about that stuff I, just, I don't like complying because I'm just stubborn. And I like my freedoms. I, I like to hold on to the old stuff. I don't, I don't like seeing the direction we're going and just willfully going with it. But I'll tell you one thing it does say to me. It says my time is short. Yeah. My time is short. And the Bible tells us to be sober and to be vigilant and to watch. We need to be watching, ready, warning to not get caught up in the doctrines of the last time. Now, as we're seeing all this unfold, you know what you see? You see a bunch of new doctrines springing up. New you know how many new teachings have sprung up in the last 150 years in the world? Even in the realm of Christianity, you know how many new teachings are springing up within the independent Baptist movements? You get all kinds of new teachings. Watch out for those new teachings. Look at uh, 1 Timothy chapter uh, 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 1. 1 Timothy 4 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. And what? Doctrines, as teachings. Doctrines of devils. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now here's a couple of the doctrines of devils. Forbidding to marry. Forbidding to marry. You know, Catholics have been forbidding to marry for years. Peter, the first pope, he had to get his mother-in-law healed. 
how do you have a mother-in-law with that? I mean, I got a mother-in-law, but it didn't happen just without with me staying single. <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God had created to receive with thanksgiving them which believe and know the truth. So uh, there's some doctrines that are showing up. And the Lord's saying, hey, you got, in the latter times, there's going to be a bunch of doctrines of devils that shows up. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Timothy's warned about this stuff even in his time. you got to watch out for a new teaching. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Pick up verse 1. This know also than the last days. Perilous time shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Amen. Covetous. Amen. Boasters. Amen. Proud. Amen. Blasphemers. Amen. Disobedient to parents. Amen. Do I continue to say amen on all this stuff? Unthankful. Unholy. Without natural affections. Man, they're killing their babies and they're throwing them into dumpsters. Ain't normal. Nothing normal about that stuff. Without natural affections. Truce breakers. False accusers. Incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Right now, if you stand for righteous, you're the enemy in public, in the public eyes. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. For... For of this sort are they which creep into houses and leave captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse loves, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Oh man, you get, they get on the internet, they're ever learning. Yeah. Knowledge is so increased today. Right. But they ain't coming to the knowledge of truth. Right. They're getting knowledge, yeah. but it ain't doing them any good. It ain't saving their souls. Not bringing them to Jesus Christ. Now as James and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no farther, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, Persecution, affliction, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, which persecuted, I endured. But out of them all the Lord delivered me. Now what's he saying? You've known my doctrine. Look at verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. What's he saying? He's saying, the teachings have been taught to you. Continue in them. Don't, don't get distracted by all these heavy, high-minded, all these sinners, all these false doctrines, all these doctrines. Don't get distracted. Let me tell you, we, we have an old faith. We have old belief. We have old standings. We have some, an old book. We have some old teachings out of that old book. Don't waver on them. You don't need something new. You need something good, old, tried, and tested. Yep. That's what you need to hold on. Don't go looking for some new teaching. I, I don't need some new teaching tell me when the rapture's going to be. All I need to know is that I need to be faithful in doctrine and in deed, looking and waiting for my Lord to come back, and He can come back any day He chooses. But I need to be ready. That's what I need to know. And that's what I need to be standing on. And that's what you need to be standing on too. You don't have to find something new. Number three, as the Lord, as the time draws near and we look for the Lord to come back, we need to learn to live godly. Look at Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. I've got to hurry up here. Titus chapter 2, look at verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, 
teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So you should be out witnessing, you should be standing on the doctrines of the old time faith, and you ought to be cleaning yourself up. It says, to uh, teaching us denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. You know, today is not the time to become like the world. Today is the time to become more holy and to stand out and stand on righteousness and to stand for what's right and make a distinction between the holy and the profane. That's what we need to be doing today. You know what people want to do? They just want to fit in with the world. They want to accept the world today. They want to make themselves the skull church. That way you can have the cool tattoos. You know? They, they, they want to bring in the world's music and mix it with the music of the Lord. Oh. Oh, you know, today we need to be making a difference between the holy and the profane. Why? The Lord gives us a warning with the Laodicean church that we need to buy us works tried in the fire. Quit being lukewarm. You know what the lukewarm is? I got a message on lukewarm. You just take cold, you take hot, you mix the two together, and you got lukewarm. You take the world, you take the church, you mix them two together, and you got lukewarm. That's the day and age you live in. And the Lord says, that disgusts me, I'll spit it out. I mean, when my coffee gets lukewarm, I stick it back in the microwave. When your life gets lukewarm, you need to get back in the book. Amen? You need to learn to live godly. Next thing I see is he tells us to occupy till he comes. Take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 19. Look at verse 13. Now this is a parable. This parable has to do with servants that are left with talents. Okay? And some of uh, one of the servants, he gets tenfold, another gets fivefold. The other, he doesn't get nothing because he buries his talent. And the Lord gets a little bit upset at that one. Why? What's he doing? He's just standing there looking up into heaven. <laughs> he ain't doing nothing. And uh, look at Mar- uh, Luke, chapter, uh, Luke chapter 19. Look at verse 13. Luke 19, 13. It says, And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Now, occupy doesn't mean to set up residency there. It's the same as the word occupation. Occupation. Occupy. In other words, make it productive. Make it resourceful till I come. Use it. You have an occupation, you're doing something to make it productive. That's your occupation. Occupy till I come. And his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. Same as the Jews rejecting Jesus Christ. And it came to pass when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him, to whom he had been given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by his trade. So the Lord wants you to occupy until he comes. In other words, you need to be busy working for the Lord. We have only, there's only one life, it will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. Everything that we do for the Lord, we will be rewarded for that will amount to something for eternity. You say, what do I do for Christ? Well, it may be as simple as mopping the floor, changing the light bulb, passing out a track, getting behind somebody that's a better witness than you and supporting them. Hey Amen. Not all of us are good witnesses. I don't have the greatest talent in winning souls. And you know, I find some guys that have some pretty good talent, and I send them to Africa and support them, make sure they stay there. No, I'm just kidding. You know, I mean, 
That's our missionaries, our foreign missionaries. So we get behind these guys. We support. You know, when you support a missionary, you take part in their ministry. You know, when you support this church, you take part in this church's whole ministry. I mean, one guy can't get all them tracks out at the Christmas parade. That takes a church effort. You're all part of that. And uh, what, what is that? That's us occupying until He comes. We're trying to be productive. You know, I, this year we need to try to be productive to do something for the Lord. We did some things for the Lord last year. Let's do some more things. We need to occupy till He comes. Number five, what condition will you be in when He comes? And this, I'm going to wrap it up with this. Take your Bible and turn to Revelation 22. Revelation chapter 22. The Lord's coming back. He's coming back with your permission or without it. He's coming back whether you're ready or whether you're not. I, I can hear it being said. 60. Ready or not, here I come. You ever play hide and go seek? <laughs> I mean, you hear that phrase. Ready or not, here I come. Revelation chapter 22. Look at uh, verse 10. And he saith unto me, Seal not the saying of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. He's coming back. How's he going to find you? Are you going to be the righteous one? Are you going to be the holy one? And he's coming back to give you the reward for your works that you served him with? He says, I come quickly. He's coming. His coming is sure. His coming is definite. His coming will not be altered or delayed. When He chooses to come back, He's going to come back. Are you going to be ready when He comes back? How's He going to find you? Are you going to be occupied until He comes? Are you going to be standing on the doctrines that you should be standing on? Are you going to be watching and be sober? Are you going to be witnessing for Him, filling His great commission? What will your condition be when He comes back? I hope I'm doing all four of those things. I hope I'm doing the things that He commanded me and told me to do. hope I'm faithful till He comes or He calls me home to heaven. One or the other. Most of y'all are older than me and maybe the time will come where you get an early departure. It's possible. We never know what day will bring forth. I might beat you to it. I don't know. Might not make it home, man. Semi truck can take me out. I don't know. But I want to be faithful till that day comes. I'm looking for him to come back. I, I, I'm looking for the early retirement myself. I want the Lord to call the trump and call me home to heaven. Early retirement. They come by work the other day to want me again a 401k. That never works with dealerships because they fold up every couple years. I mean, I've had so many owners sell out from under me as I've been working. I, I don't take any faith in the 401k stuff. Right? And if you do, that's fine. I'm not saying it's a bad thing for you. It's just never worked for me. <laughs> the secretary that offered you, are you interested? And I know she's a Christian. I go, no, I'm not interested in that. She goes, you already got your retirement plan, don't you? I'm like, yes, I do. <laughs> I got my retirement plan. I'm going to die serving Christ or be raptured out of here. That's my retirement plan. Hey, hey, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the retirement. Some of you benefit very well with a good retirement. And I'm glad for you. I ain't got much hope of that. Social Security. 
I ain't got much, I I got eternal security, but social security, I have no security in trusting him. (laughs) I mean, I just don't trust that it will be there when I get to that age. You know, I'm, I'm not counting on that. I'm counting on the Lord to come back. But if he doesn't, I am determined to be faithful in these matters that I know I was commanded to do till he comes and occupy till he comes. How about you? How about you? All right, let's have a song of invitation.